bit about myself. I'm an artist. I live here in Washington, D.C. Um, this is my studio. I make um, paintings, drawings, and some prints and site-specific work like the project here at the Hirshhorn. Um, so um, just to give you a little sense of what I do when I'm not doing site-specific works in museums and galleries or telling secrets to a bunch of strangers early in the morning, um, this is where I spend my time. And each one of these pieces is about six feet tall. This is the one that was in the center of that last shot. So um, just really quickly, the work that I do in the studio, um, I make objects. So these are um, paintings on mylar, usually with acrylic ink. And um, they're all separate from the architecture, so they're all movable. And in order to view them, you don't have to move around. You can stand in one place and, and see them um, from any vantage point in the room. Um, and I'm telling you that, you'll understand why I'm telling you that as we move forward in the talk. So um, what I'm gonna do is um, show you some of the other site-specific projects that I've done and, um, and, the, and sprinkle in some confessions along the way and, um, and then talk to you about the project here at the Hirshhorn. Um, so, The title of the talk today is Three or More Confessions, and confession number one is that I gave it that title because I thought it might make you want to come hear me tell my secrets. <laughs> <laughs> and confession number two is, when I gave it that talk, I thought to myself, when I gave it that title, I thought to myself, oh shit, now I have to figure out what I'm gonna confess to these strangers. And um, I knew that I was being asked to talk about my work and not just to reveal my inner secrets. And I also knew that my mother was going to be here. So I figured, shout out to mom. Um, so I figured I ought to keep it clean. So I am going to um, tell secrets, but they're going to be um, related to my, my practice. Um, confession number three. So before I confess, um, everybody here is familiar with Impressionist painting, right? So um, Impressionism is, was, in the 19th century, a very important art movement, and I have a deep appreciation for it in terms of um, the role that it played in the way that, um, that art progressed. However, there is one very important Impressionist painting that I deeply dislike. And this is it. Um, I know I'm probably not supposed to say that I don't like this painting because it's probably one of the most um, beloved paintings, um, especially here in Washington, D.C. So this belongs to the Phillips Collection, and people go to that museum specifically to see this painting. It's called Luncheon of the Boating Party, and um, it was painted in 1880 to 18, 1881 by Renoir. Um, is this mic still on also? I feel like I'm getting some kind of feedback. Okay, I'll stand back here. Um, so um, in 2010, I was asked to do a project at the Phillips Collection as part of their intersections program. And part of that um, invitation was that I got to chose, choose which gallery in the museum I would be working in. And the gallery that I chose to work in happened to be adjacent to where this painting was hanging at the time. So as I began my work there, I thought, awesome, the docents are gonna come through with the visitors, they're gonna explain this painting, I finally won't hate it anymore because I'll understand it, and the exact opposite happened. So um, what happened was that I heard them coming through explaining why this painting was so important, and then it was, you know, this was Renoir's fiance, and this was a famous actress, and this was a, you know, an editor of an art magazine, and, um, I just thought, what is so fucking fascinating about this? I mean, I really don't care. So, I mean, again, like, Impressionism really matters, and I see the importance of that painting. It was, you know, it was sort of more like a snapshot, and that was really radical at the time, and the Impressionists were radical. Um, but I just, I don't like that painting. Anyhow, so um, moving on. Um, the painting that, so it, the Intersections program 
what they do at the Phillips Collection is they invite contemporary artists in to respond to the permanent collection and make works that are in response to those pieces. And so the painting that I chose to respond to is this post-impressionist painting by Van Gogh called The Road Menders. So this was painted about eight years after that um, last painting that I showed you. And um, Van Gogh was also a radical, um, but he was really different than the other Impressionists because he didn't have all those important friends. He wasn't hanging out with actors and art critics. He was actually, um, I can't, what the Wikipedia thing said, um, he was considered a madman and a failure in his lifetime. He sold one painting before he died of a self-inflicted gunshot wound. Um, and, um, but, but what he did was um, so animated, and that's what I love about this painting. So um, I decided to riff off of this piece, and I asked the museum to hang it in between these two archways. Um, and then I worked in the gallery just behind that. So my site-specific work um, responds to the architecture, and in this case, you know, I definitely built what I had planned around the idea that there are these two arches and that I could hang the painting between the two arches so that um, visitors to the museum could see my work and Van Gogh's work you know, through at the, from the same vantage point. Um, but again, going back to that idea of the work that I make in the studio being different than the work that I make on site, you can't actually see the whole piece from one vantage point. So you really need to um, look at the work from this perspective and then step inside the gallery. Oops, hold on a minute. Step, I'll get to confession. I swear to God I'll get to confession number four. <laughs> step inside the gallery and, and I'll show you what that looks like. Um, so when I made this piece, I had been doing wall drawings for a number of years, but this is my first um, major museum exhibition, which leads me to confession number four. Um, when I'm asked to do these projects, my first response is of excitement and delight and honor. And then my second response is terror. Um, you know, these, are, these, these works are done on site and, um, and there's this always, always the sense that I could fuck it up. Um, but so far that hasn't happened, luckily. Um, so when, I, when I'm invited to do projects, I, um, I don't talk about my terror. I just um, move forward, put my head down, and convince myself that everything's going to work out beautifully. So this is the view from inside that gallery. Um, the ceilings in here are about 10 feet tall, and the full length of the wall, I think, is 24 feet. And that's one more view. So the site-specific pieces are ephemeral. And in the case of the Phillips Collection project, it, that was kind of magnified because they had this, this you know, important work from the 19th century um, hanging on the wall right in front of my piece. So this is being, so the Van Gogh is being preserved and cared for, and my piece is going to vanish and be painted over at the end of the exhibition. So there, there was, in a way, it was um, a great opportunity to really speak to those differences and, and my intent of making work that is ephemeral. Um, let me just see, was there something else that I was supposed to talk about on this slide? Okay, so um, a year after I was invited to do this project, I uh, received an invitation from the Hammer Museum in Los Angeles to do a site-specific work there. And this is the project that I did um, at the Hammer Museum. So um, that wall there is about 23 or 24 feet tall. And the, um, let's see, is this a pointer here? So this is like a standard height doorway to give you a sense of scale. Um, and the full thing was 70 linear feet. So this took me 12 days to complete, working about 14 or 15 hours a day. And that's generally how I work on the, um, the on-site projects, is I just kind of like barrel through them. This is a detail. So now I'm gonna just um, try and explain a little bit about my process. I'm gonna show you a piece of a video that the Hammer Museum made while I was working. So, um, 
The main thing that I want to get across in this video is how the lines get drawn. So if you can picture that you're walking behind a person and maybe walking a little bit too close to them, and instead of looking up, maybe you're looking down at the ground. If they were to stop short, you would bump into them. And that's basically how I draw my lines. That, so, you can, so, if I'm, so when I'm drawing a line, um, I'm focused on that exact point at which the marker hits the wall. So if there's a little um, wiggle or bump in the line that came before, inevitably my next line will bump into it. And, and, and so it kind of creates the domino effect, which eventually leads to this um, implied movement, or some people refer to it as waves or folds. I usually call it slippage because that's really what it is. It's my hand slipping a little bit. <laughs> Okay, so let's see. There we go. Fast forward 2015, so a, a little over a year ago, um, I was invited to do a project here at the Hirshhorn, and this is a, a, a detail of the piece that I completed. Um, so my first response, of course, after I was invited was, um, Yippee! And then um, my second response was, holy shit. Um, and um, I'm going to spend the rest of the talk sort of going, uh, doing a play-by-play -play about how I, how I completed the piece that's on the second floor. So this is what the galleries looked like before I started my project, when I came to do a site visit. So I'd visited the museum many times in the past. Um, but I had never come here to do a site visit to look at the architecture specifically inside the galleries. Instead, you know, usually when I'm here, I'm looking at the artwork that's hanging in the gallery. And so when I do site visits, I look at things, details that, you know, ordinarily we wouldn't have any reason to examine. So I was looking at the quality of the light on the walls, and I was looking at the little recessed areas at the top and bottom of each wall, and then, um, the things that I noticed were, like, I knew that there were these doorways going around the circle, but I didn't realize that they were recessed. So there's actually four of those. And then I was also noticing the, um, all the patterning on the floor, and there's actually a lot of color on the floor. Um, so in addition to those little recessed areas, there's also openings, right? So this is the big opening when you come off the escalator. But there are also um, three other smaller openings throughout the gallery on the second floor. So this is called the um, Inner Circle Gallery, and, um, and this is kind of a, like a sketch, a uh, bird's eye view of it. So um, out here is the Outer Circle Galleries, right? So I don't have that drawn in. But um, what I did when I started thinking about the space was I started thinking about how am I going to unify this broken circle. So here's where you come off the escalator, and then these other three openings here, and then here are those recessed doorways. And, and so there are all these breaks in the circle, and I thought, I really I want this to read as one continuous piece. How am I going to do that? So I, so I numbered the walls one through eight. So this is wall number one down here. So as you come off the escalator, if you turn you know, and go clockwise around, you're counting wall one through wall eight. Um, so in order to figure out, in order to unify the space, I decided that I wanted to have the walls painted in two colors, uh, a very pale yellow and a very pale gray, and that that color would run all the way around the gallery so that my eye could kind of skim across those interruptions. So that was the first decision that I made about unifying the space. And then the next thing I started thinking about was, how, well, what color am I going to draw in? What color line will it have? And I knew that it's, it's, it's close to 5,000 square feet. It's something like 4,800 square feet of wall space. So I knew I needed to kind of distill everything. So I decided I'm just going to use one color of ink, and it's, um, it's called Payne's Gray, and it's an acrylic ink that I diluted with water to greater and lesser degrees. So to get a lot of variety in there, because you, know, you don't want to have the same thing going on for almost 5,000 square feet, there needs to be some variety, but I also needed to keep the variables under control. So by, by diluting that ink to greater and lesser degrees, I essentially created more color 
by having a darker and a lighter version. Then I also had um, like thicker lines and thinner lines, and then I also had the density of the lines, sort of the proximity of one line to another. So between all those different things, there's actually a lot of variety in the piece. Those were two decisions, the wall color and the, the color of the line. And then I had to work on all of the um, compositional decisions. So I did about 30 or 40 of these little preparatory drawings, and these were done to scale. Each one's about three inches tall, and the ceilings, the walls upstairs are 12 feet high, so, so there's the scale there, quarter inch scale. And um, the length of each section of wall upstairs is between, I think, 46 feet and 54 feet or something like that. So I needed to kind of um, figure out exactly what the compositions were gonna be, so then I could sort of have, um, a skeleton to start with when I started working on site. So I honed these um, preparatory drawings down to eight, and then I inserted them inside this scale model to kind of finalize my ideas and look at the way in which um, the sequence would work on site. So this is the preparatory drawing for wall number one. And what I want to explain to you here is that I, I use these circles, this geometry. So there's actually four circles here. There's this one, this one, that one, and that one. So the, the drawing riffs off of those circles. That's where the drawing starts. And by, by using that kind of geometry for each section, I was able to take the geometry from the three inch high drawing and transfer it onto the 12 foot tall wall and then sort of start with, with that framework and drive the drawing forward on site upstairs. So these are some of the preparatory drawings lined up with the elevations of the gallery walls and double, triple tech, tre double and triple checking my work and my measurements. And then they got scanned and um, we laid um, the geometry on top of my prep drawing so that we could actually measure each circle and figure out how that was gonna transfer onto the wall and where the center of each circle would land on the wall. So when I got started upstairs, we were able to just like pinpoint where the center of the circle should be and we had this giant compass and we just spun it around and laid the circles out on the walls before I started drawing. And in some cases, the center of the circle fell below the bottom edge of the wall or up above the top edge of the wall, in which case we used a template to sketch out the edge of the circle. So this is me drawing my very first line on February 29th of this year. And, um, up until this point, I'd been working in my studio for months getting ready to do this project. So I had been doing my color studies and I'd been doing all those prep drawings and I'd been thinking through it and trying to figure out all of like how long it was gonna take and mapping everything out. And then suddenly I was here on site working and there were people watching me draw my first line and I had performance anxiety. <laughs> um, you know, as an artist, as many of you know, because you're working in creative fields, the, the way that we are able to um, produce work is by being very critical. So you, you do one thing and then you sort of like sit back and use your critical eye to figure out how it can be better and how you can get your point across more clearly. And that's what I do every single day in the studio in the privacy of the studio. So when I was doing it here on site, even though when I started this project, the second floor was closed to the public, there were still plenty of people milling around. And I thought, oh my God, they're all looking at it through the same lens that I look at it through. You know, that everything I do, I'm you know, contemplating it and critical of it, and they're probably doing the same thing, but it's unfinished, don't judge me yet. And I realized that that's not, I couldn't do that, because the whole installation took me 65 days. So I thought, I, I can't do this for 65 days, I'll, I'll lose my mind. So I put my blinders on, and I blocked all of that out, and just barreled forward. 
So this is a picture of wall number one and the preparatory drawing for wall number one. So the point here is just to explain that here's that geometry that I was talking about. So here's that circle, it got transferred onto the wall here. And same with the other three circles of that prep drawing. And this is the tool that I used to draw upstairs on the wall. It's um, a big fat magic marker that comes empty. And so I put that ink in there that I talked about, that acrylic ink called Payne's Gray, and then diluted it down. And so these have these um, felt tips, like a regular magic marker, except for that they can be replaced. So the, the tooth of the wall um, wears them down pretty quickly. I think I went through 70 or 80 of those little felt tips. Okay, so this is a video that the Hirschhorn made, um, and the first 35 seconds or something equals 64 hours. So um, this is the first wall that I did was, took me about 65 hours to do. Okay, I'm not gonna take up your time showing you a video. Hopefully you'll get a chance to go upstairs and actually see the piece. Um, so the, sh the, the second floor was closed for the first 35 days that I was installing, and then it reopened to the public, at which point people came and were able to see me working. So there I am working, and there are the visitors checking their Twitter feeds. Um, and um, this show is different than a lot of museum exhibitions because, um, you know, usually what happens is an exhibition opens and there's sort of like the curtains get thrown open and, you, and the visitors come in and see the show. But in this case, um, people got to see the piece developing over the course of time. So there was this first 35 days, the only people that saw it developing at that point were people that were working here. And then the, the second half of the install period, um, anybody who came to the museum could see what I was doing. So again, that mind control thing of like um, not, letting, not letting that gaze, knowing that people were watching me, knowing that people might be judging what I was making and how it was developing, just blocking all of that out. Um, so this is a detail. That's wall number one and wall number two. One of the things that I, that I miscalculated was I was thinking of it really, you know, if you think back to that slide I showed you of the scale model, I really was thinking of it in terms of this circular gallery and that people would come off the escalators and walk through the space in a clockwise manner. But what I hadn't realized is like, not everybody goes clockwise. Some people walk counterclockwise. And there's also those openings that I showed you pictures of. So not just this opening here, but the other three openings. And that, you know, some people, they go into the outer gallery and then they pop into the inner circle gallery and back and forth. So it's really not a sequential experience. Um, and with each one of these site-specific projects that I do, there's some kind of big miscalculation. That, um, that I learn along the way, you know, that I, that I come to grips with along the way, and that really is part of the excitement and delight of doing them, is realizing how wrong I can be. Um, so, um, I'm gonna throw you a curveball. Um, just hang with me here. This is a painting that I made in 1990. Um, so I made this painting when I was a senior in college, and um, let me explain to you why I'm showing you this picture. So um, I'm showing you this picture because I really do believe that it represents the common threads that my work had then that I'm still playing around with now. Uh, so let me explain to you how I made this painting. I stood in my painting studio with a bucket of water, and I cupped the water with my hands, and then I tried to capture that image in my mind's eye as the water seeped out between my fingers. And as I watched the water escape from between my fingers, I was also very aware of that sensation of my inability to hold on to it. 
So I could have taken a picture of my hands cupping water, but instead I did this over and over again, watch the water seep out, and then I would paint, and then I would do it again. So um, when I look back at this, I can see how it foreshadowed my interest in the process rather than the outcome. And so this picture portrays hands holding something that can't be held, and it's an illustration of something that's fleeting. So in the case of my current exhibition upstairs, the piece itself is fleeting. So it's open for a year. It closes on August 20th of 2017, at which point the piece will vanish and be painted over. So this is an illustration, and the piece upstairs is a demonstration. So this illustrates a fleeting moment, and the piece upstairs is fleeting. So my point here is that our reality is experienced largely through sensation, not just through our visual field. And that reality of sensation can be expressed through work that's representational or through work that is non-representational. So experience over objects. This is sensation and experience and that's embedded in the work. It's embedded in the process rather than being expressed through illustration. So this is a faithful representation of my experience. And this piece makes a demand on the audience that the, that, that small painting doesn't make. So in order to really understand the piece, you, the viewer has to walk through it. You can't sit still. So you become immersed in it and it becomes part of you, and you become part of it. So this leads me to my final confession. Sometimes when I finish a piece, whether it's in the studio or whether it's on site, I think that's the last piece I'll ever make that has any value, that's all I've got, I can't go on, I'm finished. And I've been having that thought now for 30 years. <laughs> so clearly I've been wrong, at least up until now. Uh, when I was in graduate school, I had this fantastic mentor, and there was a point at which I was um, really struggling with my work. And he came into the studio, and he did a critique with me. And, it didn't really resolve anything. It kind of confirmed all of my greatest fears. And then he left the studio, and I plopped down in the chair, and I put my head in my hands, and I thought, what the fuck? Like, I don't even, I don't even know why I should keep trying to do this. This is ridiculous. And then I heard little footsteps coming around the corner, and he stuck his head back in through the, through the doorway, and he said, nothing is going to happen if you just sit there. And I hear his voice to this day, and I use that to get myself up and moving again every time I feel stuck. So that's all I'm going to give you today. Thank you. <laughs>